Hey everyone, my guest today is Michael Cyril Creighton. Michael stars as Howard Morris in Only Murders in the Building opposite Steve Martin, Martin Short, and Selena Gomez. And this most recent season also included Meryl Streep, Paul Rudd, Matthew Broderick, a host of others. We'll get into that. Some of Michael Cyril Creighton's other TV credits include The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Dexter, New Blood, A League of Their Own, Dash and Lily, High Maintenance, Bob's Burgers, AJ and the Queens, AJ and the Queen, Two Broke Girls, New Amsterdam, Blue Bloods, Nurse Jackie, Orange is the New Black, 30 Rock, and many more. Creighton played abuse survivor Joe Crowley in Spotlight, the 2016 Academy Award winner for Best Picture. Other films include American Fiction, The Post, Game Night, Paper Spiders, and The Outside Story. On stage, he has been seen in Stage Kiss, The Amateurs, and four world premieres by the Debate Society. He wrote, created, and starred in the WGA award-winning web series, Jack in a Box, which was inspired by working in a theater box office for over 12 years. So much more to come, so much more <laughs> that he did that we're not going to spend time on. Google this great, beautiful artist. But Michael, I am so happy to have you on the podcast today. I'm Welcome. so happy to be here. I don't know if I ever told you this when we met back in the day. Do you know that I have a weird obsession with Last Night of Ballyhoo? Like I saw all of you in it. I saw, I was probably, it was probably my senior, freshman year of high school, of college. Um, and I came back for break and I saw Jessica and then I saw Cynthia and then I saw you or whatever the order was. And I don't know what it was about that play, but it was just, I saw it so many times and I loved it so much. And that's how I got introduced to your work, which I loved. And then you were famous to me. When I saw you in Kissing Jessica Stein, I was like, it's Lala Levine. <laughs> Lala, Lala yeah. Levy Levine. Um, and that's how I met Paul Rudd. He was in the cast yeah. before me. Um, in that show, that was like a really amazing experience. And I got to see Alfred Urey again, um, most recently when Parade was happening uh, at, on Broadway. And just to kind of get to tell him again in person what that show meant to me. And yeah. like you, it was just, um, I was a fan of the play. And then I was like, I'm in the play I'm a fan of. It's a really... Yeah, it's a really cool thing. Well, I remember when... Jessica Hecht wore a jacket from it, like one of those show jackets when we were doing Stage Kiss and I lost my mind. It was like you like put the Holy Grail in front of me. I was like, can I touch the jacket, please? Oh um, my God. I don't know yeah. what it is. This is my, uh, this was like, you know, the day that we took photographs uh, uh, for the show with um, the, my beloved Carol Shelley. And uh, uh, anyway. Thank anyway, you. I wanted to tell you that. I'll probably I cut all that out because it's too much about me. But, but <laughs> thank you for saying that. And um, I remember, so I met Michael officially when he did this Sarah Rule play called Stage Kiss. And I remember watching you. It's the first time I met Todd Almond and you. And, and those were my takeaways from this play. I knew Danny Jenkins. I knew Jessica. Dominic, my husband, was in the play. But I remembered watching you and going, this is... A, a, a comedic genius in front of me who also brings such like deep, deep truth to this part. And I feel like that combination of hilarious and like gravitas and like really grounded in truth and feeling is something that like I see this trajectory of your work where it like brings together this, this like all of you. Um, and I mean, Spotlight, obviously, when I saw you in that, and I'm sure everyone says this to you, like it's haunting and beautiful. Mm -hmm. And the idea that the same actor is Joe in Spotlight and Howard in Only Murders in the Building in some ways makes complete sense to me. Yeah, that's the funny thing is that I, I, I did stage kiss. I don't know if you know my story is that I worked in the box office of Playwrights Horizons for 12 years mm -hmm. and, or I think it was 12 years and I left and uh, cause I went to do a play at Williamstown and I was like, this is my way out. Uh, like I have two weeks up, <laughs> up in the Berkshires and then my career is going to start. And then I ended up working at another customer service job as soon as that play was over. Um, but my first day of training, I got an audition for stage kiss and I almost didn't go because when I read it, it didn't seem like the character was physically my type or that it was going to be my type. And 
I was very careful when I worked at playwrights never to, I always just did my job. I wasn't like, I'm an actor, put me in this, put me in that. So right. I was sort of like, is this a favor, whatnot? Um, but I ended up going um, on my lunch break from training for that other job and I got it. And that's why I ended up in Spotlight because the um, director of Spotlight's agent saw Stage Kiss and somehow translated what I was doing in that crazy, hilarious farce and said, this is a guy you got to see for Joe Crowley. Um, and they didn't. And then she called them again and said, you got to see this guy for Joe Crowley. And um, that's how it happened. I, and I, I couldn't figure out how someone saw me in Stage Kiss and translated that into such a such a completely different part. But I'm starting to understand the connections with all of it. Yeah, because because there's um, there's like this beautiful... I mean, comedy is many things, but it's also cover, right? It's deflection, right. it's cover, and there's a vulnerability just to you and your person. And I and I think what a smart, smart producer. So when you went in, did you read for Tom McCarthy? Did you get put on tape? No, you... I just got put on tape and then I waited for a long time. And I had worked I worked really hard on it because I got the script and I read it and I was like, Oh, I understand this guy in such a in such a deep way. I, I just know that man. And then I started to do a little research to try to find out, oh, it's a real person. And oh, I found an article somewhere where his nickname, it came out that his nickname was Princess. And I was like, okay, well, that's funny. He's a funny guy. Um, so I did all this research before the audition. I worked on the accent really uh, more than I normally would um, because there's nothing worse than a bad Boston accent, which I have been guilty of at times. And um and then I just went in and taped for it. And I taped once, just once. And that was it. And then I waited for a long, long time. And then it was very fast. So then I got the job. I was suddenly going to Boston to meet the man I played. Uh, I was in re a rehearsal with Tom and Rachel. Um, and that was it. And um, I, I always say that like the, 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 I think that performance is what it is because I spent so much, such a long day with the man I played. And then um, once the movie ended, we actually be stayed in touch for quite a long time until he passed. Um, but I, I credit him to the performance because he is he is all those things. He is uh, deeply vulnerable, uh, extremely um, wounded, but covers it so well with comedy. I think when I called him, I left him a message and I said, hi, uh, this is Michael. I, I'm going to be playing you in a movie. I think we probably have a lot to talk about. And he left me a message back and was like, well, I was always hoping it would be Gina Davis, but I guess you'll do. Um, and so we got along very well. Wow. So what does that mean, like, for listeners who haven't had an opportunity to play a real person or are just fans of the film? What does that mean to spend the day with someone? Is it is it um, like a blind date? Is someone with you guys sort of for me, it was, it, no, no, it was for me, it was like a blind date. Like, I didn't know what he looked like. We had spent um, like a, an hour or two on the phone and I, they didn't say I had to meet him, but I, I they said I was he was open to meeting me if I wanted to. And I, I felt like that would be important. So when I talked to him on the phone, uh, I was like, wow, this man is so resilient. And so he's really come so far. The damage is so deep, but he's really so uh he seems to be doing so well uh and then when i saw him in person i saw like what the physical damage was of a lifetime of trauma um which was really interesting because he was so good at covering it with humor and over the phone and the quips and the but in person i saw him uh i saw some of the damage that was done he was the best he was so funny I have thousands of text messages from him and like, he was a talker. He was, um, but it was, it was, yeah, we just kind of met, we talked, he told me his story. I was very careful not to get super emotional about it because that was not my place there to like take on his thing. Um, and I sort of observed how he moved a little and how he, how he um, deflected quite a bit and, and just right. sort of, the next day I was filming and it just sort of was there yeah. and just also meeting him and feeling his essence was uh, informed the scene so much because he was just so lovable and likable and um, what was done to him was so awful and really threw him off course. And it made me wonder what his life would have been like had it not happened to him. 
you know. You know, before we get into uh, one amazing breakout role after another in the last few years, but as, you know, listeners heard, a, a big body of work before these breakout sort of parts happened or, or just the perfect um, opportunity to showcase your unique talents. Can we go back a little bit in your own life and sort of your growing up and who was in the house and how you found the arts and a little bit of your own history? Yeah, sure. Uh, I have a single mom. She's young. She was like, I believe, 17 when she had me. Um, so I grew up with my mom, her three sisters who were all younger than her and my grandparents in their house. And then where was that? That was on Long Island in um, North Shore of Long Island. And then when we when I got to be probably 12, I think we moved next door, me and my mom, to the house that my grandmother grew up in. So me and my mom lived next door to my grandparents and they still live next door to each other now. Um, I went to Catholic school my whole life. Uh, well, my whole first through first through tw uh, 12th grade. Um, didn't love it, <laughs> but went uh, and sort of, I don't know how it happened, but I always, I, I, I told my aunt I wanted to take acting classes at this theater in Port Jefferson, which was a town in Long Island. And um, she got me an acting class. And then um, I did a like little Alice in Wonderland, I think sort of play and then I got to high school and I was like, I'm going to be well-rounded and I'm going to play football. I don't know what made me think I could or wanted to play football. I have no interest in sports whatsoever. I just really had this idea that I was going to be everything. I was like, I'm going to play football and do plays. And then the football thing quickly was like, no, I'm not going to try out. I don't want to. Um, and just started auditioning for plays. And that's sort of how I figured out what I wanted to do in high school. And then I went to Emerson College for, for uh, acting. And you grew up in like it's not an it's not an unprecedented situ unprecedented situation, but I can't imagine that like everyone in your class was raised by a super young single mom and her extended family. Yeah, Is that sort of um, front and center for you, or this is your reality and it was normal for you, or were I, you very yeah. aware of that being a unique familial? scenario I think I was aware of it being unique but I also wasn't ashamed of it like I certainly wasn't um I wasn't ever like oh, I wish I wish there was a father in the picture like I never felt like I was missing anything because I had all of these like hilarious women and a great grand my uh, uh, an excellent grandfather um and my uncle so I had like a close family that was taking care of me and I was lucky because they were all sort of close to me so it was like this weird hybrid sister aunt sister mother sort of thing um and it was like my grandparents were the ones that were like the parents that we were all right. Afraid. Right. um but for me it wasn't um it wasn't odd I mean it got odd when I got into high school and then like you know nuns certain nuns would have certain opinions about premarital sex and single motherhood and whatnot and I would uh anonymously speak up in notes here and there just being like I don't think it's very Christ-like to be judging a single mother <laughs> you know obviously everybody knew who that note was coming from but I Writing thought with your anonymous. Hand. I know <laughs> <laughs> as a woman like I'm like trying to like <laughs> make it <laughs> yeah exactly. but um yeah no it was just my reality and it was also like I think what cr made me who I am is like I just had all these really funny Irish Catholic women around me that um sort of influence my sense of humor and the way I interact with people. I don't know how I got into what I, how I do what I do. Cause I was thinking about this earlier. It was like the worst thing you could be in my family or the worst thing you could be called when, when I was growing up was conceited, like, uh -huh. you know, and like, there is, it's, a, all, it's all about humility. Yeah. And that's like my whole like family unit. It's a unit is all about humility. It's not about being conceited. It's not about showcasing. And so, right. I actually do feel like I'm always sort of two things at once. Like I'm a very confident, uh, insecure person or I'm like a very outgoing introvert or I'm a very, um, you know, so it's interesting. Like, it's just like not, no one in my family does what I do. And I don't think I they still think, understand it. Uh, first of all, starting in the theater um, and, and coming up, 
you know, when we came up, um, yeah. it, you know, I think so much of like the, the mission statement is, and, and, and working with the great Sarah rule and certain writers, it's being in service of the writer being mm -hmm. in service of the script. And I feel like sort of that mantra, um, I think allows people, I grew up in a household, very, like a very similar vibe, which is like, don't, don't, don't show off. You know, my mother yeah. was not the typical Jewish mother who would show everyone, you know, pictures of her grandchildren and be like, yeah. this one's a doctor, this one's a lawyer, even though this one was a doctor and this one was right, a lawyer. Right. Even though that was very much what would happen at, you know, the 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 lunch she would go to. Yeah. And so I do think like looking at it as I'm actually an artist in service of something bigger. Yeah. But then there's a lot of attention that comes with it too. And people at a stage door wanting your signature. And I've told this story before, but Alan Alda, who was the lead of the first play I ever did in Jake's women, the, on the rare occasion, he would go to the stage door um, really because he just wanted fresh air and like to get some food. Yeah. He would ask whoever asked him for, an autograph to to also like give him their autograph you know it, it became oh, super huh. complicated yeah <laughs> i bet like, but i don't have an extra playbill to sign right. like, i mean i would sign like alan just if you could sign and then we could all just yeah get we could food. go <laughs> exactly but like the the, ex the the kind of depths he went to to sort of equalize yeah the, the fan and and artist experience but all yeah. that being said was it Catholic school because that was the tradition in your family or the schools weren't great in the neighborhood? So we'll say it was the tradition school. in the family. Um, it was, and I should say, just going back that my family is super supportive of it, of it all. It's just so out of their experience. Although it's yeah. not because the Catholic church and the Catholic mass is so theatrical. I mean, like the, the dresses and the outfits yeah. and the yeah. glass, the stained glass and the yeah. sets and like, so. And the um, entrances and the exits. From yeah. The there's like, it's life. very theatrical. Yeah. Um, but no, it's just, that's, yeah, it was like my whole family always went to Catholic school and then my mom taught at my high school. So I got to go for free. So there was, that was like sort of a no brainer. Like it was a Catholic high school. That was a good high school that I could go without paying tuition. So that was, that was what I did for high school. And when you came to New York, did you, like, did you come and see theater growing up? Or I know a lot of people on Long Island who, actually still haven't been to Manhattan like there are I know I know is that crazy yes, it is. what the heck <laughs> I don't know um were you coming in to see stuff yeah yeah I started started pretty young like my family did like theater and we would go see um I forget what the first thing I saw was it might have been Little Shop of Horrors or it might have been Nonsense or something like that I remember being young seeing those things um but I saw a lot of musicals with my family and like it would be like once a year we'd go see a big musical my grandparents and my mom and me. And um, and then I remember the first straight play I ever saw, I don't know what year it was, was Indiscretions. Do you remember that play? Oh, Very much so, yeah. It was, uh, it was, I just couldn't get over it. Like I'd never seen a straight play before. And I was like, oh, I, I still remember how it visually ended. I loved everybody in it. Um, so yeah, that was that was what we would do. We would see theater and, and I, um, when I got out of college, I lived on Long Island for like a year, I think, or a year and a half and would commute into the city for my day job, which was, or night job, it was both. Uh, I worked at Drama Department, the theater company, which was my internship in college when I'd come home for the summers. And um, I worked in the office and then I would do stage crew at night. And then I would take the train back to Long Island and do it all over again um, until I eventually moved to Astoria, which is where I have been forever. <laughs> So I feel like Spotlight really helped move the needle in terms of, of your visibility and people kind of going, that's like a really special actor. And then looking and going, oh, he's been around for a while. This is just a great showcase for his beautiful talents. Yeah. Um, but Only Murders in the Building, which is now in its third we're about to start the fourth season. The fourth yeah. season. So I'm I've watched I'm I'm watching the third season. Yeah, we haven't started the fourth, but yeah, just finished the third. Right. So first of all, you know, as I caught up this season and the opening credits begin, they're just beautifully illustrated opening credits with 
Michael Cyril Creighton walking in front of the building um, <laughs> or, or someone that feels very much like you. Yes. Um, this cast has uh, like embraced you and you've embraced them in this ensemble. I guess I, you know, I don't know how much um, you're allowed to talk about your experience of working first of all, just starting with Steve Martin, Martin Short and Selena Gomez mm -hmm. Um what is the dynamic? What is the set life like? What is the world of working on only murders in the building? It's incredible. It is. I mean, I I am keenly aware now that not all jobs are created equal, as we all know. And this is just one that I will love every minute that I am able to do it. Um, there is nothing to complain about. Uh, if I ever think of anything to complain about, it goes in a different box because like the day-to-day -day experience of doing the show and being with those people is unreal. Like, I mean, it's a, it's a masterclass. It's a great hangout. It's a, it's so satisfying as an actor and as an audience member to watch to the things I've gotten to watch be made. Um, I think it comes down from the top. Our showrunner, John Hoffman is just the greatest guy. And um there, Steve Martin and Selena are just so kind. They are um, very uh, open. They are very, they treat every actor with such respect, be it a day player or, you know, Shirley MacLaine. Every actor they seem interested by and fascinated with and they're complimentary. Um, and it seems very sincere. They're, um, it's, it's the best. And when I did the first season, it was supposed to be one, episode or no it was one episode two episodes and uh the first episode i did it was before vaccines and everything and i got covid so the second episode i they could have very easily written me out because i had a scheduling conflict that was going to bump right into it but they waited the 14 days until i was better and then just to be extra safe they filmed me alone so i filmed my whole big episode in the first season alone. And I was pretty devastated about it because I thought this is my chance, was my chance to act with Steve Martin and Selena Gomez and now it's over and Martin Short. Um, oh, well, well, that was that was nice, but that was it. And then um, it, I couldn't even imagine where, you know, where I am now that I'm a regular, like it just kept going. They kept writing for me. Um, the writers are incredible. It's really the best there. It, it's sitting watching like, and then it gets better and better, sitting watching Paul Rudd do uh, like, act like an idiot for like an, like an hours and hours, just be such a jerk to everybody was so yeah. funny. Watching Meryl Streep sing that song. Um, and during that day when Meryl was singing the lullaby, at one point Steve Martin turned to me and all the other act guest stars and day players and co-stars. And he was like, this feels like a really special show of his moment, doesn't it? So it's not even lost on them how special the show is. It's just really like, I have to say it's the nicest job. It's such a fun character. The people are so wonderful from the crew to to the cast. And I feel very lucky. And this, this is a really good stretch, this job. It is incredibly dialogue heavy. And it really, you know, I think about Maisel, which you were also on. I feel like you guys are asked to speak a tremendous amount of dialogue at a very quick pace it your show moves so quickly yeah. um, and there are a lot of you and and it feels like a when you watch it a obviously it's very meta this season it is a play literally yeah. a play within the show but um is there is there Aaron Sorkin pressure a la West Wing where it's like you have you have to be word perfect and it moves really quickly is there room and improv and you know everyone is so funny and it doesn't feel that it doesn't feel like there's ever pressure but it's always ends up being word perfect like the writing's so good it's one of those cases where the writing is so good that it's just very easy to memorize i find and um you don't really i mean mazel definitely is like they have that like say it this fast and say all these words and don't deviate and sort of i went to a different part of my brain doing mazel because it was like oh it's it's really just talking fast and, and saying words like and it does the job. This is a little different because it's um, there's so much character under all of these characters, I guess you'd say. And um, uh, the so yeah, like we play around a little bit. There's usually like a fun take maybe at the end, but generally it's sticking to the script. Uh, and it never feels rigid though. It always feels really fun. 
someone asked me the other day, said uh, someone's, uh, the showrunner's husband said, you know, people ask me if you actually talk like that. And I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, Howard has a very specific minced way of speaking. I don't even, I'm not even aware of it, but if I sit back and think about it, yes, obviously he has got a very- I guess I I do speak like that because I'm I guess Howard sometimes, to a yes. certain degree. But yes. there, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a sort of iambic pentameter to the right. Like yeah. there's a rhythm built in. Um, so when you began, and as you said, it was just uh, meant to be a the idea that like possible recurring or a two character a two episode arc maybe recurring has turned into like the opening credits are are the four of you. Um, yeah unreal which is just fantastic and i'm sure everyone in port jefferson is screaming with pride uh, <laughs> about their their local their local hero um can we talk a little bit about you know there were rumors and i don't know if it's true for a while there's been a a buzz in the air that maybe martin short and meryl streep are a couple and that's sort of been printed and out there in the world and this is not um, an episode where we're going to break that news officially or not <laughs> Um, but it's fun to think about and it's fun yes. to watch the show with that possibility. For oh, it's so fun to think about. I really don't think they are. I mean, I wouldn't, I don't know, uh, but I don't think so. I think they've said they're not. I will say they definitely um, have a great friend chemistry and great chemistry as scene partners. And I think that's what everybody's picking up on is that they just work really well together. But also she, I feel like anybody who interacts with her, it could be said that they're dating because she's just so char like you like get googly eyes around her. She's incredible, as is he. Um, but no, I don't think they're dating. I think they're just friends. <laughs> okay. Well, also to that point, Andrea Martin and, oh God, and, so and good. Steve Martin um are so I mean, just that's why I was asking about like the pressure with lines, because it it's like there's so much that unfolds in every scene and and every episode feels like 10 episodes in terms of yeah. like how much plot happens. So just talk a little bit about like, I don't know if there was a table read at the beginning of the season and Meryl and Ashley and uh, Paul and Jeremy Seamus, like are, is everyone there and Andrew, like is everyone there? Yeah, we do it on a Zoom. Like we still, we've only done table still reads Zoom on- life in a way. Yeah. The only one that we didn't do on Zoom was the finale because it was like we were in the middle of filming something okay. um, and everybody was in the same place. But uh, we do it on Zoom. And that's that's a crazy feeling of like being on a Zoom and seeing all of these icons in their natural habitat. You're like, like screenshot, screenshot. Yeah, like screenshot. eating yogurt or like, like, you know, just like, you know. Being like, where do I where do I look for the script? Like everybody sort of on equal footing. Um you know, I always have a ring light so that I can look as good right. as possible. No one right. cares, but like, right. you know. Is that um, the first time you interacted with Meryl on that first Zoom read through? No, because I met her during the post, uh, when we did the post, but oh, I boy. still like, I mean, she'll always be Meryl Streep to me. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm able to, because I interact with Steve Marty and Selena so much that I'm able to be a little bit more loose with them. Um, although I do find like in general, this has always been my thing don't take speak just to speak or take up space just to take up space. Like I usually only in, like talk if I have something to add to the conversation or if I think it'll kill, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not like they're running my mouth in the green room all the time. Totally, uh, I get it. But Meryl, oh, I just like, I just will. Oh, I, it was something I couldn't get past that. That was Meryl Street. You know what I mean? I don't think yeah, I ever was normal life. Um, yeah. Has Taylor Swift come to visit the set? No. Could you imagine? <laughs> could you imagine? I guess I could, but no, she has not. Okay. That's all. We're yeah. Done. That's all I really We're done. That's all I wanted to know. <laughs> oh, no, because I was planning on coming to visit the set. Um, yeah. So how do you, how did you handle being on Maisel and did, did Only Murders in the Building and Maisel happen at the same time or... Yeah, I was, work? I mean, I think uh, I'm lucky. I think part of reason the reason why I am a regular now is because I kept booking work that would conflict with murders episodes. So like in the first season, part of the reason why we had to tape, shoot me alone and I couldn't do it later is because I was immediately going to work on Dexter Newblood and they were in first position. And then um, 
second season of Murders, I got Maisel at the tail end. And then it became a real sort of tricky thing to make that schedule work and to get me into that finale with all the fainting in season two, um, which is what was my one of my favorite things to do. But it Did was you say all the fainting, all the fainting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that 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 Special was skills. tricky. That was like it would become. I would actually call the first AD on murders and be like, I'm Yourself. done. Like, yeah, I would just text. Out. Like the middlemen were doing what they could do. Right. But sometimes I'm like, I'm just going to tell you that I'm done at one. And I can, if you pick me up from here, I can come there and, and do work. a little bit. So it all worked out. I think everybody was afraid that I couldn't do both at the same time. But here's the secret to everybody. Everybody can do both at the same time. So if everybody just makes it work, it can work. Yeah. Um, but I was really lucky that um, Murders was so flexible during that time. And um, yeah, but I was doing them concurrently near the tail end well can you talk a little bit about did you watch Maisel were you a fan of the show yeah I was a fan of Maisel um I thought that was I I, it was one of those things I had auditioned for the pilot and then I had it's very hard for me or it got it was hard for a long time to say no to auditions I just that's not how my brain worked but I sort of had to train myself to be like sometimes you have to believe that there's something better along the down the line in a specific show. And um, so I I did pass on a lot of auditions from Maisel because a lot of them, when I would read them, I was like, I don't see what I can add to this. And it seems like it would be just a blip. Um, you mean for guest spots going for guest spots? Yeah. You like, didn't get the pilot. Yeah. 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 And right. I wasn't right for the pilot at all. But I, I also, these, these guest spots that came up, some of them weren't right uh, or weren't, I didn't feel like I could pop in them or, or whatnot. And then I did, I have auditioned for other parts though on the show. And then when this came around for the last season, it just was such a great match. I mean, it was such a different version of myself that I haven't been able to play on screen. Um, it was such a great, I made such great friends on it because it was this unit of guys playing writers. writers room, yeah. So we just spent a lot of time together and I really, really liked them a lot. Um, Rachel watching her work is, is, is like so incredible and fascinating because she's so precise every single time. She's just incredible. She does not falter. She is uh, perfection. And yeah. so, Right. And it's such a hard thing to do is really, yeah. it is so hard to talk that fast and be that funny. And, and also it's, ex I mean, also she's probably often exhausted, right? Like, yeah, I mean, but I've never, never saw her alone. complain in eight months. I never saw her complain once. And so I feel like I'm been pretty lucky to see, like really have really incredible tops of the call sheet yeah, on most of the shows one. I've done. Yeah. No real bad eggs at all. And, um, so that was really cool. It was like also cool to be in a period piece and and neat to be on these big lavish sets and and the way the Paladinos work is so different than the way only murders directors work. And I really liked their their vibe and and so it was cool. I loved it. I mean, I love doing it. Can you talk a little bit about auditioning? Because maybe now, because you've sort of <coughs> done a a lot of work as Howard and a lot of work on Maisel and they are very different characters. You know, the great Bill Butler has plenty of tape to send out now if for the one person who doesn't know who yeah. you are. Um, yeah. But talk to me about, you know, people are often surprised at how much actors still have to audition and read. Um, yeah. You know, even when they're a series regular on something, what's your process? It got, it's, well, it's changed a lot. Uh, I think I'm not a good in-person auditioner in general. I love self-taping. I really do. I love a Zoom audition. I love a Zoom audition. I just love a little bit of distance from that moment of like, the thing that makes me nervous is being myself walking in the room and saying goodbye and then saying three things too many. Like, you know, I mean? right. like, like just stop. Or also just switching gears from the banter, the hello, or like, yeah. oh my God, the subway. And then- That feels like, so inauthentic to me. I'd yeah. rather just just do the scene. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, I, honestly, I feel like my career really took off. Like not took off, but I really started working once I didn't think I could ever work again during the pandemic when I thought it was all over. Like it took all the pressure of all what I thought audition should be and what I thought I should be doing. Um, 
I feel like it something lifted. And then because it all seemed not real, it seemed like we were never going back to work. It seemed like these mm-hmm. tapes were just like, well, I might as well have fun and take the, there was no pressure. Cause I didn't think it, I just have gotten into the sense of thinking it's not real. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, this is my chance to have fun as a character and that's where it ends, you know? Um, so I try to, and I've tried to make the self taping as civilized and, um, you know, easy on myself as possible. Sometimes I won't memorize everything. Sometimes I will, I actually do the scenes often uh, with a recording of someone else and just edit myself out so that I don't have to waste anyone's time because that was always a problem. Um, But as far as like the material, I just try to approach it the way I approach everything, which is, you know, find both sides of what's going on, you know, find the humor under the darkness and the darkness under the humor and all that. You did a lot of producing, creating, and making your own content. So for so many people who just dealing with editing is either A, brand new, or an impossibility, right. you already have filmmaking skills. Like you already know with with nothing to make something. Yes, um, that is a big plus for sure. Yeah, I can... You can do the thing you just described where you record and it like, I'm, I don't know what you mean. So I'm saying- right, right. <laughs> Yeah, something, you know, that idea of like the 10,000 hours and one thing that Malcolm Gladwell talks about that sort of ends up being the thing that allows you to be really comfortable in a moment where so many people are so uncomfortable having to do all this stuff for themselves. Yeah, So that's kind of amazing. So all of these jobs happened post COVID. I mean, uh, Dexter murders either during or post Dexter murders Maisel American fiction uh all of that is all post COVID New Amsterdam like just stuff that New Amsterdam had a hundred and something fever because I had just gotten a COVID shot and I was like I don't want to do this tape but I'll do it um there's just I do love self-taping I just think it, I'm like I like the control of it and I like the and I've gotten to a point where I'm not spending hours and hours and hours on it. I'm making it a little bit more pleasant and yeah. enjoyable. So, yeah, but I audition all the time. I don't, it's very rare that I get an offer just out of nowhere. So do you feel successful? Um, so, well, that's such a weird, I, I, I constantly am like, what does it take to feel successful or what is, what is success? And it's, what does that mean? I feel like I belong in a, this is, well, let's say this. Okay. So during the strike for the first time in forever, I felt like I belonged to a community and I was exactly where I was supposed to be. I don't always feel that in theater um, at all, really. You know, there's always sort of the sense of like, watching it from the outside because I was always watching everything from the box office even when I was part of it it was sort of I I always have this sense in all things of watching it from the outside um because I've always been like the guy who worked in the office or the guy who worked in the box office or the person who worked for the production company um I don't know if I'll ever shake that but when I was on the picket line with all of these actors that I've admired for so long uh that I've known or known about for so long. And then we were all sort of just on equal playing field. It just made me feel like, wow, I do belong. I have, uh, and that felt like a success to me. Um, I feel I'm proud of my career because I think it could have gone several different ways. And I've made some really smart choices, I think. there was definitely a path where I could have, my whole career could have just been playing guys that work at shops that are nasty to women buying dresses. Like right, there's right. nothing wrong with that. And I like that kind of character, but if that was all I was doing, I uh, it's not one sustainable, it's two not good for my psyche. And I had so much more to show. So I think like, um, yeah, I do feel successful. I feel like I've showed colors of the person that I am. Um, of the actor that I am and the characters that I can play and have not let myself be as limited as I think some would keep me. Does that make sense? Yes. I wanted to ask if it was meaningful to you to be that Howard had a boyfriend, has a boyfriend on the show. 
Um, did that thrill you? Yes. I mean, it was, it's amazing to play a full, a, gar a gay character with a full life. I had been on other shows where I had a husband and all we did was stand next to each other. We never had, you wouldn't even know we were husbands if they didn't just put it in the breakdown. You know right. what I mean? Right. Um, to have romance and vulnerability have and romance and vulnerability and to set that up and then it's just there and that's part of his reality and that's part of his life you know um that felt like an extreme gift and i do feel a great responsibility to be like there's not a ton of gay guys that look like me uh having careers that are varied like that where that or having love interests or being more than just the sidekick and whatnot. So I, I feel lucky and, and proud and happy that they added that in for sure. And I will, I'm always sort of try to be thoughtful as far as the roles I pick, as far as where it's coming from in that, that sense, sort of. If, if you have a chance, if you've ever had a chance to kind of sit with your showrunner writers, have they ever told you like, why they were so clear that Howard, because there were a lot of characters in the first season that lived in the building. They mm -hmm. didn't know how many seasons they would have, although they're, the trifecta of stardom mm -hmm. leading the show was, there's a good bet they would get a season two. Yeah, <laughs> at the yeah. Very least. But also, would Martin and Steven Selena want to do it? Like, there are a lot of unknowns at the beginning. Right. How long they would have want, you know, are they going to love this and want to stay with it? And clearly mm -hmm. they do and did. Did anyone ever say to you, like, I just want you to know this is why we wanted you to be a a, a, a long part of this family? Do you have a sense of what that is? I have a sense of it. No one said it outright, but I do know that um, I, I, I personally, I feel like I'm my best on that set. Like, I just am like, uh, in all ways, you know, I'm not always the best person. I'm not always... Sometimes I can be negative, whatnot. I'm just my best version of myself there as an actor and as a person. And I do think that um, the trio really likes me and respects me. And that, um, you know, just came with just being myself around them and not trying to impress them, even though all I wanted to do was impress them, you know? Right. Um, so I think that we have a good rapport. Uh, I get along with the showrunner. I love the material so much. I always want to honor the material um i don't know how it happened but i just it's one of those jobs where i'm so lucky that everything sort of pointed in the right direction and they kept me around because they you know there's a lot of apartments in that building there's a lot of characters and people come and go and it has nothing to do with whether they're great actors or likable or anything like that it just is like the way the story goes i don't know what has kept me around I mean, part of me knows what it is, you know, but um, I'm grateful for it. I'm so happy. Like, thank God. Well, I just have to say, as someone who's had the privilege of knowing you for a long time, I think every once in a while, there's this lightning in a bottle thing where the person and the part converge in such a beautiful way that it's undeniable. And then once they felt that, the alchemy of that, their ability, the luck for you that their writers understood how to write yeah. for you so that you just kept like getting better. The character just yeah. kept having, you know, it's like, it's an amazing thing when someone knows how to write for you. Yeah, and, it is. I mean, and it's such a beautiful partnership to have that chemistry is just extraordinary. Yeah, they really do. I mean, they really know how to write for everyone. For everyone. But like, yeah, everyone. It's just they really hit these like these grace notes, I guess you'd call them. Like they just know exactly my. Like they don't even have to write that like a line, like a line in the middle of a sentence is suddenly angry. They won't yeah. denote that. I just, we know each other. Like, you, know, you intuit it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Like, the show know. is absurdly funny. I mean, it is, it's so rare for a TV show in 2024 not like a chuckle but like to sit alone you know in your living room and laugh really I thought wow I'm laughing out loud so much yeah and, and that's it's incredible who is on this show it is incredible what you are all doing I mean just 
and just the cleverness and just Marilyn Martin on a fairy, like the tooth fairy. It's crazy. It's incredible. It's crazy. And then you get like, but you have all these like giant icon stars, but then you get like the best of the best character actors, working theater people, yeah. like, yeah. you know, Jackie Hoffman, Jane Howdy Shell, you know, all of them, like Don Daryl Rivera, who I never had met before, but he plays Bobo and he's in Aladdin. He's been in Aladdin for like 5,000 years. And just to get to meet this New York character actor who's bringing his A-game alongside all of these other incredible icons. It's great. It's just the whole set is so great. Wait, who's the actor who played the the uh, the guy living in the theater? Peter Bartlett. Peter. Peter Bartlett. Peter Bartlett. Just is... watching him in that scene, I was like, everyone is giving a master class. Like, I can't yeah. believe. Also, what's so incredible and impactful is you know there's not a lot of time. Like, this is a very proppy show. Like, yeah. like if you're in a play, it would take weeks to figure out like, wait, when do I put the pen down and I have to yeah. have the clipboard and I have to be in here and then there's a fog machine and then I'm doing a puppet show with stick figure. Like, it's crazy. And the yeah. idea that everyone is doing it and God bless your editor because it all just oh, feels- They're so crazy. great. Is it all shot on sound stages? Is there- Mostly, yeah. Almost all. Oh, uh, beautiful apartments are-, are Yeah, those are all fake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's incredible. Your designers are just the production design and the props and the wardrobe. It's all incredible. You're incredible. Um, there's so much more. I look forward to talking to you about the next time you come on. I'll come on anytime. This is so fun. Oh my God. It's so great to see you in that little box next to me. Oh. Um, before I let you go, Michael, is there a little known fact about you that you can share? We thought about this because I'm sort of an open book, but I, there is a little known fact that I am the master of two very specific, not that great impressions. One is specifically Julia Child on the HBO show, Julia, calling for her husband. And the other is Bjork complimenting your fingers. So those are two impressions that I do. Would, should I do them? Do you want me to do them? Um, I would be honored. I guess I have to. Hopefully it will come off well over Zoom. So this is, <clears throat> clear my throat. This is Julia on Julia calling for her husband. <clears throat> oh, Paul. Paul. Oh, Paul. Coco Vaughn. Paul. Oh, Paul. So that's that. <laughs> and then Bjork complimenting your fingers. Um, Alana, you're such a creative creature. Your fingers are long and they're green. So those are those are my two not that great impressions that I have mastered. Michael Cyril Clayton, I love you. I thank you for being here today and sharing so much of you with Thank all you for us. having me. Until next time, my sweet. Until next time. Thank you. You're such a great host. Oh.